Greetings, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. I'm really happy to be here virtually in the Morals and Machines event to talk about Taiwan's digital transformation. The first question is, why do I think Taiwan has been so successful in managing digital transformation? Well, indeed, Taiwan is selected as one of the top four super innovators, according to the World Economic Forum. And the reason, I think, is that we have broadband as human right. Whereas in other countries, you may have internet as a human right, but in Taiwan, anywhere, you have 10 megabits per second. If you don't, it's my fault. And we make sure that the 4G unlimited data plan is just around 15 euros per month. Combined, it makes that any new government services reaches the maximum amount of people. And we also make sure that in indigenous places, in the rural places, and so on, that are the places that we look first when we're deploying 5G connectivity. And so the geography of Taiwan, of course, also help. From the northmost to the southmost of Taiwan, it's just one hour and a half by high-speed rails. So because of that, I think we can be maximally inclusive when we're rolling out new digital services, along with a constitutionally protected education budget that makes sure that design thinking and creative thinking can be empowering all the students regardless of where they are in the Taiwan island. The second question is, for a country to be equipped for the digital future, its inhabitants must be equipped for it. How should the education system be designed so the citizens are equipped to live and work in the digital future and so that their fears are removed? So I think it's very important uh, to have people's fear, uncertainty and doubt to be answered through practice as early as possible. I often take the metaphor of fire. Fire is, of course, the origin of civilization, but it's also very dangerous. It has the potential to destroy cities. But people worked with fire by not limiting it to a series of um, ritualistic uh, priests or shamans or pyromancers, right? People teach each other cooking, even young child cooking, as early as possible, so people understand the dangers, but as well as the safety concerns of fire. So it's the same as with machine learning and so on. Because we have brought as a human right, from this year onward, we are uh, introducing a new curriculum that have media literacy and ICT critical thinking skills, not as one particular class, but integrating it into all the different classes and different fields of education. And so through this way, people learn from a very early age to become data stewards to uh, become responsible data holders so that they can measure, for example, their air qualities very easily from their schools and their packed balcony and so on, so that the abstract concepts such as accountability, data stewardship and so on make sense in a very early age. And we'll also give all the primary school um, school children uh, free access to our Taiwanese uh, supercomputer which is top 20 supercomputer cluster that has equipped with in-place open data storage of all the atmospheric data and meteorological data and so on, so they can freely do experiments on it. The third question concerns the digital transformation by the democracy, which focus our mindset more on political decision making and participation through digital media and processes. So what would be the core elements of democracy 4.0? I think the core element, as with other democracy revisions, is trust and legitimacy. Uh, in social media nowadays, people tend to have polarized views because the government doesn't give a context of the why of policy making, but just the what of policy making. So personally, I practice radical transparency. Every single meeting that I chair, every meeting with journalists and lobbyists and so on, we publish the full transcript after 10 days of co-editing into the internet for a future reference. And through this way, people cannot really argue from a you know, private um, benefit in lobbying. They have to argue based on public benefits. And by radical transparency, people can also sit virtually in my office right, and feel what it's like to be in the daily life of a digital minister. And so through this way, the accountability is provided well before the policy is introduced. And that, I think, builds the foundation of trust because then people can understand why in the context of policy making. The fourth question concerns, do we need new ethical rules in the digital world? Of course. In the digital world, you have different rules of engagement. You tend to engage with parts of people rather than the entirety of people. You tend to engage with people's um, synthetic uh, image of themselves instead of a you know, spontaneous image of themselves. And all this changes the rule of engagement drastically. 
This year, we're witnessing uh, artificial intelligence that is capable of synthesizing um, what looks like coherent uh, speech. Uh, if you go to talktotransformer.com, they can generate essays uh, that on the surface looks very convincing, but it's actually synthetic. And the same goes to so-called deep fake technologies for facial expressions and things like that. And so we need new ethical rules in making sure that people can attribute um, the text, the image, the authorship into an accountable fashion that people can understand when algorithms make judgments based on the profiles that they get collected. They need to understand the data is the beginning of a relationship that imbues the fiduciary duty of the data operators. And if the data operators use it instead uh, to generate synthetic images that um, falsely represent the person donating uh, their personal likeness and so on, that would be a violation of trust. And all this were not possible, or at least were were very expensive um, before the current generation of machine learning algorithms. So I think the society needs to have a public, uh, not just demonstration, but rather a public conversation around it and to establish new ethical norms. The five fifth question is, what does being radically transparent, as I explained, mean to me, and how has it changed uh, myself? Well, as an open source developer and engaged in a free software movement, radical transparency is just a norm, right? Because the internet government derives its legitimacy in radical transparency. The internet society, the RFC process, the IETF, has no army, has no navy, uh, has no air force. So the only way that they can compel people to adopt radically new protocols is just through radical transparency. And by radical transparency, also radical participation. And by radical, I mean at the root meaning that from the inception of the idea into the deployment and iteration and feedback, everything needs to be kept in a way that makes the full accountability like every line of code, every line of change, every documentation change, every test change, need to attribute it to somebody. And that somebody need to be held into account to explain why exactly is they doing this commit message or pull request or things like that. And so I'm at the moment just putting this into a political realm so that we can deal with um, code, not just the code of algorithm, but also code of law. The fifth question concerns how can we achieve more diverse representation in the field of developers who are shaping our future? I like this question very much. I think diverse representation stems from diverse uh, backgrounds of living. So in Taiwan, actually in the east side of Taiwan, about half of our territory um, is around 15 or 16 indigenous nations. And each of them bring a diverse culture that is very different from the western part of Taiwan, which is um, considerably more western. Uh, so I think what really makes sense is not one side or the other dominating the discussion, but rather making sure that all our public decisions, if they concern, for example, a precinct or a township that has more than half population in one particular indigenous nation, then it needs to be done bilingually or even in the language of that nation. And when we choose the language this way, we also use machine learning, like we partner with the Mozilla Common Voice to make sure that the indigenous people, people with uh, more lower uh, resources when it comes to uh, convincing the multinational to adopt their languages, uh, won't shrink uh, from the introduction of voice technology and other machine learning technologies, but rather can introduce their language in a way that is uh, effortless as possible. We have specific acts such as the National Languages Act, the Indigenous Languages Act and things like that to ensure the equal representation and also representation of their culture into our K-12 curriculum. So regardless of what the ethnicity you are, you can opt in and become part of the Indigenous culture just in the K-12 education. The seventh question concerns, uh, what would I have done in my life? I haven't taken a job as digital minister. But actually, this is exactly the same thing as I've always been doing. Um, regardless of wh whether I wear the hat as digital minister or as a civic hacker or a hacktivist, I'm always doing the same thing, namely making online channels that can collect the collective intelligence and demodulate and modulate the various different positions so that we can find common values um, out of the potential diverse, divisive uh, landscapes and perspectives. And the internet is very powerful because it lets people find their tribe 
people who think like you. But also, it lets you find people who don't think like you, but nevertheless can converse with the same value as you, even from a different position or perspective. So, for one particular policy matter, you may have people who specifically understand the domain, or people understand the emerging technologies that can bring back better solutions, or people who are working in the public service or the regulatory sector that can realize this for maximization of、uh, social impact. And my work is just to create spaces. Such as the Taiwan Presidential Hackathon, to put those trilingual teams together and give them binding power, namely by giving the president's award a trophy that,、um, when awarded to five teams every year, the trophy is a projector. That if you turn it on, it projects the image of the president handing the trophy to you and signals the presidential promise that whatever you prototype during the three months of hackathon, we will actually take it to the public service and maintain it indefinitely. But actually. A large charity, a large MPO, a large international NGO, a large multinational, a large for-profit company with good、um, um, CSR strategy can all do this, right? It doesn't have to be a public sector or the president. It can be realized in any of the different fashions as long as they work、uh, toward the common goals. That is the UN Sustainable Development Goals at the moment. And so、um, I'm very happy to work across sectors by using exactly the same methodology and toward exactly the same aim. That is partnership for the global goals. And finally, the last question: What will have changed in the Taiwanese society in the way people interact with the digital world in five years' time? Well, we have a digital transformation plan that says in the next five years' time we will have digital twins、uh, of each other. That is to say, we will be very easily interacting. With the virtual avatars in through 5G technology,、uh, so that in a classroom there may be actually from six different classrooms, but we weave them together into a virtual classroom, and people can interact with other people、um, in real time as if they are actually there and interact、uh, in a way that maximizes、um, the teachings.、Um, Impact toward people in rural or indigenous places and things like that. So you you can see that Taiwan values、uh, by far the equality and social justice of digital transformation. We want to empower the people who are currently. Blocked by geography, blocked by cultural、uh, differences, blocked by a minority status in the community, and so on, but bring them into this、um, new digital world that is maximally inclusive by automatically presenting their positions, their sentiments, their feelings in a way that can、um, build empathy between people of different cultures and let people build a policy. And、which we call holopolis. It is like a hologram, holographic uh, polis uh, of people, and let people understand that we have the common future, and we can deliberate the common future not just by voting, which is like providing three bits of information, uploading it every four years, but rather through radical participation in the budget level, in the presidential hackathon level, in regulatory co-creation level through sandboxes, as well as、uh, just by、uh, mobilizing social resources so that we can. Realize the social benefits, environmental benefits, with a good business model as well. So this is called triple bottom line. So I think the digital technologies is just to make sure that people trust each other's numbers more through distributed ledgers and so on, to foster effective partnership, as I mentioned about trilingual teams, as well as open innovation, so that people don't have to、uh, fail. They can just try and find out what doesn't work, what does work, but maximizing whatever that they learned into a digital world in the common. So thank you for listening, and this is my contribution to the Morris and the Machines event. Thank you so much.